Give me a warning at 30 and then another one at 40. Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to not say a lot of things that are going to be repetitive for you because I'm assuming that most of you are pretty familiar with article writing. I, I, I should read to you the request that Kosha sent to me. So it's an email that says, because we're reading history and this is already wiry history. So uh, Gosha told me, I think more, more or less people know general rules, so that people would be you. Uh, and if you can tell them from the expert point of view how to write the best article, types of articles, etc. And then, uh, for example, how to write an interesting article about new flowers on the local square. So I'm going to try to uh, talk about how to write uh, a nice article about new flowers on the local square. Wow. <laughs> no. Is the content about boring things? Yeah, no. Seriously, seriously, what, what I think what this is about is that media has changed. Right? And we were just talking about this in the previous, in the session before Philippe and I uh, presented. Media has changed substantially in the last 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago we were talking with different vocabulary, with different knowledge. Most people did not know the concepts that are now familiar to pretty much everyone. And so the way we address issues are, has, has to necessarily be reflected in that. So let me start really quick by giving you a little bit of uh, the 1990s, and I'm not going to waste time here because Philip and I already talked about it. So keep just in mind a few key facts. Uh, number one, the zeitgeist at the, uh, let's say, 1994, when the project officially started, was three years, three years after Rio 1991. And so we are really at the very beginning, at that time, of uh, post Rio, the post Rio agenda. So things that have become familiar to everyone, to every single kid that can, comes out of our school system now, that watches on CNN live as the conference in Paris will uh, go on. Back then, all those concepts were completely foreign. They were weird concepts in weird languages. We've now developed, we, sometimes we didn't even have terms in some languages to describe things like climate change. Uh, most interestingly, from the point of view of communications, we uh, are talking about a period in which news were more static. Now we have, you know, I've, I've noticed uh, we are in Romania, and I've been to, to a bunch of places in the middle of nowhere, and Romania is certainly not in the middle of nowhere, but here's an interesting thing. There's more international channels here than I've seen in pretty much any other place. I mean, uh, from Israel to Russia to China to the international Japanese network to uh, Arabian networks, Italian. This is Italian, you name it, it's there. So what, this is what happens in our context right now. We have immediate access to news from around the world. Yesterday, Captain Sp uh, uh, Commander Spock died. Yeah. <laughs> Philippe and I were sitting at the bar, and I told him, Philippe, Commander Spock just died, because my phone told me Spock just died. And CP24 reported that Spock just died, and we looked behind us and the BBC on TV is saying Spock just died. This is how quick things are happening. And this has to necessarily affect the way we report as young reporters. Well, not we because we're not young anymore. But. Um, and finally, of course, the, 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 the perspective that I had just mentioned before, the fact that without this European construction project, we would not have had an international young, young reporters. And I think it's probably important to dig the archaeology of that allow me the, 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 the metaphor nation building exercise and transplant that into an international setting. There are differences, but we can actually learn from those differences and we can actually build something based on cooperative models uh, that enriches and enrich the, uh, the, the type of journalism that we do. In terms of legacy, we've been talking about legacy all day, all day long. Um, and I'm not going to repeat how important is it 20 years uh, later, but I will repeat this one thing. Every single young reporter, and I, I'm not sure if we are in touch with all the young reporters or if, if we can dig them out. I'm pretty sure we should be able to. Where are they 20 years later? What are their jobs? What are they doing? How, how do they interact with technology, with journalism, with the environment today in 2015? This is very interesting data because uh, 
it's data that you don't have to go and measure from now into the future. You can actually just grab picture people that came from the past and assess what are their positions nowadays in, in relation to those issues that we've been tackling all these years. The, the third thing on that list, the A to D, let me just uh, ask here, uh, who in this room is between 30 and 35? Very statistical question. Oh, that's not so many of us, eh? Well, we're the A2Ds. The A2Ds are the only generation that is pretty much born fully analog and raised fully digital. We were born before the internet was available. We do everything. I mean, I still read books on paper. I don't really like readers, e-readers. But at some point, technology changed. And we were at that age that we were pliable enough that we could change with technology. And so we're certainly not digital natives, and I'm sure there's a few digital natives. Uh, Yukiko looks like a digital native, but I'm not sure. Uh, she, she raised her hand when you asked the question before, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, so you're at <laughs> But we're, we're not with, with those. I'm sure you've seen your, uh, your students, I mean, mobile phones and iPads and all this stuff. This is things that they, are, they take for granted. Uh, but in reality... <laughs> <laughs> These are things that we have learned to take for granted, but think about this. Uh, this little device here, this little device here is 32 gigs. 20 years ago, my computer was about this big, and it was a 286, right? This is more powerful than that machine, and quicker, and has more information on it. Right? And again, this is another factor that completely changes how we go about passing information. Uh, and uh, of course, you have the, the, the idea of the, the legacy am ambassadors. Uh, this is important also uh, in relation to something that I heard here this morning about, well, we were discussing basically things that have been discussed for the last 20 years. Uh, I, I've heard the discussion that we had here this morning several times. I've been involved in several stages of the YRE over the, over the years. And these are not new questions. These are questions that come back, and it's good that they come back. But at the same time, they actually point at something that is institutional change within organizations. Uh, we, we have sometimes a lot of younger people and we have a few older people and sometimes we lack the people in the middle. Uh, the people that can actually pass that knowledge from one generation to the other and avoid us from doing this, uh, this thing that Michael was just describing as starting from scratch every year. Of course, this is not the ideal situation and it should not be how we work. It should be much more integrated and much more cumulative than that. Before we go into the article uh, side of things, let me just tell you what happened to me after uh, 1996. So, I went to college, I studied international relations then, uh, in, and diplomacy, and then I worked with the Portuguese chapter of uh, FI for uh, seven months while I did my civil service, and then off and on different projects and a couple of other missions in which I was coordinating a few students for, for Margarida. And uh, then I started to kind of go abroad, and I haven't really been back for 15 years. Well, I mean, I've been back. I haven't really been back. And in that period, I've uh, become a journalist. So direct, direct consequence from YRE. I first became a journalist writing about uh, environmental sustain sustainability in construction in the Portuguese construction industry. From there, I moved on into a very similar site in Germany, and I worked with them for almost a year. And then some Chinese magazine heard about me and asked me if I would not mind writing a couple of articles for them. And so for seven years, I was an international correspondent for the main Chinese magazine on uh, public spaces. Uh, and that was actually quite interesting because it gave me the opportunity to shape a little bit what these young Chinese architects were reading. They were very interested in the things that we were doing in the West. And I had the forum to explain those things, to put those things before them. And so those are little changes that we all somehow end up affecting. Then, uh, you know, I ended up being a publisher. I ended up being a writer, doing political communications. And so basically what I've done all my life has been communications from every end of the spectrum. Right? And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's important to think that uh, when, uh, when you talk to your students and tell them, you know, they are 
writing an article, think about who's going to read that article. Uh, the articles are not necessarily just for an audience. You, uh, you, do you want the medium? The, um, the, uh, the, the, the articles that you write, if we are going along with the dissemination idea, they need to get somewhere else. And of course you can just do a workshop in your school and you can put them on the website and so on, but do you perhaps want to get them on your local paper? And if you do want to get them on the local paper, how do you write them? You need to write them in a way that is acceptable to a local paper. Or you have to present, you have to perhaps prepare a press release about your kid that went on mission such and such and wrote about this and that, and make that press release palatable to a journalist that is used to reading 20 press releases every day and is not going to waste more than two minutes reading yours. And so all these things are relevant to, to the way you, you end up crafting your article. So here's the question, do you write your articles for the YRE school, do you write them for the YRE community at large, uh, do you write them for the parents of your students who will obviously read those articles, do you write them for your local paper, local municipalities, remember they all have newsletters, websites, Facebook, Twitter, uh, do you write them for other partners, do you write them for sponsors, right? if you write them for sponsors maybe there's a few keywords that you want to put in there. Uh, and how do you interact your art or make your article interact with social media? Now think about, uh, and, and this has been mentioned here, uh, I'm not going to talk about that at all, but think about why are you actors, that's you and me and all the uh, young why are you that are out there right now, but then think about the beneficiaries of the projects, think about the indirect connections and uh, Michael John's little graph with a young reporter in the middle and arrows going in every, in every one direction was really exemplary of that. You have one student and that student has enough capacity to reach I don't know how many and all those people that that student reaches can reach other people. You're really talking about the networking potential and that's something that is important that the students understand from the moment they are writing. You need to, to be sure to make them aware of the fact that when you are writing about something local, you're not just writing about something local. It needs to be local, yet relevant to someone else, yet universal. So this brings us to uh, this new concept that we have for possibly the last seven years. Digital journalism, citizen journalism, it has completely changed the way uh, news cycles work. Uh, news agencies are not really sending as many correspondents to the field anymore. That used to be the key tenet of journalism. You send your journalists to the ground. You send them to Afghanistan so that they can report on the war. Well, no more. Everyone has a camera, so you put the camera in the hands of someone that is there and they do some footage and of course this brings a whole span of issues. Can you verify what that footage is? Do you know who that person is? Do you know what ethical precepts are behind the capture of that footage? So that brings a whole lot of issues. But in our case, which is a much simpler case, you have journalists on the ground that can simply uh, interact on, on their locations. That flash is very distracting. <laughs> now, uh, most importantly, where are we consuming our media? We are consuming media overall in, in, in this present time, especially the people, the young people that you're interacting with on their phones. Yeah. Quick things, quick things. So think about optimization for someone who is gathering their news on the phone. How many of your students, I mean, obviously they don't watch CNN, so how many of your students get their news on a Facebook feed. Right? They open their Facebook in the morning and they read the news that are curated. Someone that they know in their network liked something and so Facebook very uh, uh, friendly as they are. They decided that your friend likes this so you probably like this as well and so they give you a curated version of what the news of the world are today. And this is how most people are getting their news. Most young people are getting their news. I'm saying Facebook, but I could say any other number of uh, networks. We could think about Vice News, 
We could think about riot, uh, we could think about uh, BuzzFeed, we could think about Dailymotion. These are, these are not really news sites. These are news aggregators that have become the de facto ambassadors of news on a daily basis. And so when you have curated news, something else becomes relevant, and that's how do you measure the impact of those news, and that's something that Michael John was just referring to. Well, so here you get to likes, you get to sharing, you, let, you get to audience reach, audience engagement, you get to paid promos. Someone mentioned this uh, earlier today. Uh, word of caution on paid promos from someone who has paid a lot of promos for a lot of uh, political spins. They don't really work. Uh, paid promos, they buy you attention, they don't necessarily give you the attention that you want. Uh, and most importantly, both Twitter and Facebook have changed the, the way they operate in terms of paid promos. Uh, as of, I think, May last year, on Facebook and Twitter, I think October, what happens is that your news are not really shared unless you're paying for them, if you are an institution. Right? Your, your news are curated. There's an algorithm that obviously they don't share with the rest of the world, and it is who do you interact the most with, what did your friends like, etc., etc. Your paid promo is basically going to give you access to a number of people, and you could choose to just have the people on your network see the things that you post, and if you pay for it, they'll ensure that they watch it. But if you are not putting that filter in there, that it's only people that you want, it's going to be much more random than that. Or you focus on the themes. Are you talking about environment? You could go with that. But for you to be efficient and to actually get exactly the people that you want, you're going to be spending a lot of money on a rolling basis. And so there's pros and cons to this uh, Facebook model. It, it's become a completely monetized model that I'm not convinced right now. I, I've, I've used it for work a number of times. And over the last year, I simply put it aside because it's, it's really a, a model that is not delivering the results that it's promising. Okay, quick characteristics of uh, 21st century media. Think about the short attention spans. Think about the quick news cycles. Think about article f or film length. Uh, let's forget the film for now, but if you think about article length, and we were just talking about this uh, on the coffee break, some of us. When you have articles that are supposed to be a thousand words, those are articles that have a length that was planned 20 years ago, when we printed articles, when we read magazines, when we read papers. We still do, but remember, we're now reading magazines and papers online, on the phone. That's where I need my New York Times and my Economist. It's on my phone. A thousand words, it's a lot. So while this is a good threshold to have, is it perhaps useful to have also a lower threshold? In a lot of websites that people read, news should be about 500 words. That's, that's what a lot of news are today. They are basically just the keywords, just the, the, the key paragraphs. Can we distill news from whatever, whatever level of research your students are doing to 500 words? And if you do, then can you really compare an article that is a thousand words long with an article that is 500 words long? Because you're talking about two different ways of writing it. One is content heavy, the other one is key content heavy. And you can't really compare the two. They're both valuable, but they're just for different mediums. And so it's important again to go back to where you started to write it and to know before you actually do it, where is it going to go? Uh, Finally, remember, uh, there's a level of sensory over overload right there. Uh, we have all these media, this, this, and there's so much science uh, around this. We have all this media, but what that means also is that we have way too much information. We have a lot coming at us at all times, and we don't really stop a lot of time. So how do you keep attention? You keep attention by bringing to the fore the things that people are familiar with, Keywords that people identify and say, oh, this is something I'm interested in, I'm going to read this. This is where you come at the titles, this is where you come at the leads. And those are things that uh, students need to learn how to do competently. Those two key things, leads, titles, and I guess I would add uh, meta tags when you're dealing with, uh, with the internet. Now you need to meta tag everything. It's not just titles and leads. You need to put keywords, people that are interested in this they're probably going to be interested in that, and those are search terms. Those are going to raise your articles to the top of the, of the search file. 
Think about the fact that the stuff young kids read, um, are, you, are you guys acquainted? Sorry? Oh, jeez. Okay, are you guys acquainted to, with Vice News? Yeah. Right. So, I, I, I used to like Vice when they first showed up, but I, I work in international politics and it kind of pisses me off the sort of angle that they take, which is a very sensationalist way of digesting news in, to a younger audience. But in doing that, they're also attracting a younger audience to news. They're not news consumers, but they've become news consumers <coughs> through that kind of, uh, that, that kind of um, outlet. So this brings us to angles. Right? Their angle is an angle that is aimed at a, specific, at a specific age group. It's an angle that might not be to everyone's taste. It's certainly not to my taste. But it attracts, those headlines attract uh, younger generations. Now, I'm not suggesting that you get your uh, kids to write articles that are similar to Vice News, but you do want those articles to draw attention in a certain, in a certain direction. And that's what we call the bait and tackle headlines, <coughs> right? You put in the title exactly what you know that people are going to be attracted to, and then once you make them click on the title and go into your article, you say what you want to say. <laughs> and if all else fails, just attach cats. It always works on the internet. <laughs> That's a green cat, by the way, because it's ecological. <laughs> For instance, so this is very playful, but just think about uh, the way you're going to do your titles, right? Over descriptive titles, fail. No one clicks uh, GM foods in Montenegro are a risk to our health. No one clicks on that. It sounds boring. I care about GM foods and I care about what I eat and I wouldn't click on it. But if you say something in this vein, well, I might click on it because you're doing something sensational. That's, that's been the secret of journalism for centuries now. It's still working like that. They just push it a little bit further now. Let's do this. Oh. Okay. Story checklist. Um, now, are we more or less acquainted with how the article is composed or everyone is? So I'm, I'm just going to go really quick over these things. The things that are important to, rem to, to remind the students about is really, do you have the facts in there? And are those really the most important facts? Is it, you, you, again, remember you're writing locally, but you are actually writing for a whole network. And so what you are saying needs to somehow translate to a more universal understanding. And unless you have the transition that enables you to communicate with someone, let's say, in Germany, you know, you're in Cyprus and you're writing about a Cypriot issue, but there's going to be someone in Germany that is definitely going to be interested in it if you write about it the right way. So this is about transitions. It's about, you know, don't mention Cyprus in the title because if I'm in Germany, I don't care. So I'm not going to click on that title. But if you write, uh, garbage dumps are polluting our communities. Well, if I care about garbage dumps polluting my community in Germany, I will click. And then I say, oh, it's Cyprus, but you already got me. Right? Uh, is your story accurate? Are your sources identified? Remember the ethical uh, precepts of journalism. Again, not just a few of us young reporters have become reporters. That's the first training that a lot of them have gotten in journalism. That's an important place to start. And there's no reason why we should water down what the principles of journalism are. I'm sure a lot of your schools have journalism teachers and journal journalism classes. That was the case when I was in school and they got them involved. And I think it's always a good idea if you have in your schools teachers that teach reporting to get them involved in this, uh, in this program. Uh, does the story flow? And do you, add, do you use active voice? Let's skip that. Okay, editorializing. Uh, news are not opinion, right? We're not, this is not young columnists for the environment. We're not trying to change opinions on, on the base of our opinions. We're trying to report on what's going on. So news are news, they're factual. There's facts, you report on the facts period. 
When you report on solutions, you report on proven solutions. Don't make up solutions. And perhaps this brings us back to that solutions discussion, and I think it might be something that is worth Arguing because 20 years ago, again, we were looking at something completely new and we were looking for ideas, people that could bring about change. But right now, that information is all out there. So maybe we actually need to be reinforcing the idea that they need to report. Um, most importantly, the, the spin. What, what is it that you are talking about? Make sure that whatever you have or the when I say you, I mean actually your students, not you, obviously. <laughs> Whatever you are trying to put out there is the right hook. You are looking for a hook. And if the hook is not there, no one is going to read it. And you can probably measure that. Now that we have all these technological facilities, you can measure how many people clicked, how many people shared. Try some things. Try, for instance, instead, don't use the cats, but use, for instance, lists. One of the things that has the most success on the internet, 10 things that this. 20 things at this. It does not fail. Every single time. You make a list, people click, and they go through the list. Uh, that and cats. There's a, a, a few interesting things here that you might want to uh, have a look later. I'll make the PowerPoint available so you can go over this. Uh, these are specific things in the articles that you could look for to make sure that the articles are stronger, that they read well. And I'm going to skip the lead here. How, how many minutes do I have, I mean? Minus five. Minus five. Minus five. Minus five. <laughs> Uh, you gotta have some patience. I was given an hour, so. And I have a PowerPoint, so just look it up. Okay, so uh, on, the, on the leads well, and. If you want to, to take the hour on our no problem. No, I don't, I don't think I need an hour, but we'll see. Okay, so on, the, on those important things, the titles we've already addressed, you really need the most shiny things, really. You know, if anything in your story is the biggest, the largest, the most accurate, the latest, use that word. That's, that's the word that you need to have in the title right there because that's, the, that's what brings people in. And then of course you can qualify. Maybe it's the biggest in Cyprus. Maybe it's the latest in Ireland, right? But you don't need to say that in the title. Uh, when you write the lead or when they write the lead, Here's the thing, there's good leads and bad leads, and there's, uh, you know, the, the, the five W's and the H of uh, writing a basic article, and there's three that are really good for leads, and there are three that are really bad for leads. The, the ones that are really bad are these. The when, the where, the who. Don't say that Mr. So-and-so said this, I don't care, it's irrelevant, I just care for what he said. Don't say it was in Romania because I don't care if I'm not in Romania. Don't say that it was last week because I am not going to read something about last week. Instead, make sure that the leads are using these. The how, the why, the what. How of the story, what's going on, how is the story going on, what is the cause of the story, and what is the most important fact in that story. <coughs> Example here. So um, this is a transition in. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think I. Fiction. <coughs> uh, no, this, this is fiction. Um, well, this is direct quotes. You can uh, you can look at this later. Sorry, Philippe. This was a little shout out to you. But... <laughs> Okay, so quality control, um, and, and we had a discussion about quality control this morning around the guidelines and criteria, so this is something important. There's markers of what's a good article and markers of what's not a good article. 
And so when you have a good article, you need to make sure that it abides by a certain number of rules. That's what makes it a, a journalistic article. So what is your theme? What's your prompt? What's the story? Make sure that you have the story in your article and that it shows up within three lines. I need to know what the story is about. Uh, number two, once you know what the story is about, review it. Make sure that you actually have the right story. Maybe if you are, you know, usually in the newspaper you have an editor. Uh, in YRE you might have a teacher. You have to have your students get that story to the teacher and have them be the editor and tell you, are you sure this is a story? Are you sure this is not the story? Make sure that they highlight the five W's and the H. Those things have to be in the article. If they're not in the article, then the article is actually not a real article. It's missing one of the key elements of an article. Uh, highlight or underline the most important people interviewed. And make sure that the quotations are done properly, that they're not just repeating what's already written in the article. So there's, there's a couple of slides before that speak specifically to that, so you can look at that later. And then make sure that when you interview people that you still scratch out the things that they say that are stupid. <coughs> because interviewees always go on and on. Everyone loves to hear themselves. And sometimes they say things that you don't really need. So just because minister such and such said that, it does not mean that you need to put it in an article. Ministers also say stupid things that don't need to go in the, in the media. Always. Always. Well, and you write that. Yeah. Then you write your lead after you have all that. And then... You write your key paragraphs, and you use direct codes, and then you use transitions, and more direct codes, and then another transition, and so on. And then at the end of it, you make sure that your conclusion is the right thing. And your conclusion is that little information section at the end is usually something that invites you to do further reading. Right? It's not necessarily about the article. It's what links you to the rest of the world. This is what I'm talking about. And my last three lines, four lines, are, are going to tell you why this is relevant and why this should be, excuse me, relevant to you and to other people elsewhere. So, in short, how, why, what leads, yes, when, where, who, no, 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 they're bad leads. Uh, rewrite things over and over and then think about Again, I go back to the beginning, where is it going to go? And then rewrite them for those media. Make sure that you have versions that fit, you know, if it's going to go on Facebook or it's, if it's going to go on the YRE website, it's not the same thing as if it's going in your local paper. Make sure that it's relevant, that you've changed the structure, that you've changed the uh, amount of words, etc. Most importantly, we are on a social media generation, and so we are asking ourselves, what is it that the kids use? Well, they use Twitter, not so much the kids, but uh, you guys are using Twitter. I'm assuming that all the, all the offices have Twitter accounts, correct? So the articles need to be Twitter friendly. Twitter is actually one of the easiest ways to pass information along, and the media catch up on it if you do it right, if you tag them right, if you use the right hashtags and so on. And there's, there's a pretty, pretty well-determined science behind that, and it's really useful if all of you guys in coordination know exactly how to post it and make sure that the right people look at them. And how do you get those people to be connected to you on your accounts, and how do you interact with them? And most importantly, remember that Twitter, and I think Margarita said something very similar, things on Twitter and on Facebook are quick. They are not, no one is going to go back to your article three days later, right? You post an article, someone posts a response, someone in your organization needs to be in charge of posting a response to that, of engage, not necessarily a response, of engaging back with that. Twitter is a conversation. It's not a news outlet, it's a conversation. And so if you engage, the conversation goes on. It could go on for, for days because the more people talk about it, the more people connected to them read about it, the more people will further talk about it. If you don't engage, then the conversation ends when someone makes a comment. So it's an end in itself. So just to wrap up, uh, I took an example out of uh, 2013 winner. So this is an article from Montenegro. And uh, it's not a particularly good or bad article. It's one of the winners. Uh, I just took the title. So is there GM food in Montenegro? And the, the obvious problem with this title, obviously, is that it says Montenegro. Now, Montenegro is pretty small. There's also not many people in there. Uh, 
And so other than those not many people, no one really wants to read about GM foods in Montenegro because you know what, I don't eat them. So this is not how you get people to read your article. Except if you are in Montenegro. Well, that's exactly what I said, right? If you are, how many people live in Montenegro? Half a million, two million? No. Yeah, something like that. So, you know, those people will care. Almost a million? Yeah. Okay. So imagine that same, so let's let's just go back quickly. So is there GM food in Montenegro? Do you want to quickly read the lead as well? A genetically modified organism, GMO, is a living organism artificially created in the lab in which the genes of two in nature incompatible species are connected. Example, fish and, toma uh, and tomato, bacteria, viruses, and corn, sea cucumber and pepper, man and pig, etc. Well, first of all, this is kind of a crazy leap. That's, it's like, Man and pig are not really being crossed. <laughs> and, and sea cucumbers and peppers, yeah, they are. Fish and tomato, really. So the second, the second thing is that this lead does not really tell you what the article is about. Right? Well, don't assume that everyone knows what, a GM, what GMO is. But that does not belong in the lead. That belongs in the first paragraph after the lead. Right? This is not enticing you to read the article because it's just educated, it's, it's very professional, not very efficient. So, title, is there GM food in Montenegro? Now think about the how lead. GM crops may be affecting health indicators through the contamination of food cycles. That would be an example of a how lead. You are saying that the way or the fashion in which GM crops are coming into our food cycle are affecting our health. If you go to the why lead, you, you, you could go down in, and I pulled this information out of the article, right? So they mentioned things about how the food and safety uh, institution in Montenegro is looking at how that is affecting health. And so food and safety inspection authorities look at GM foods due to possible health impacts. Notice that there's no Montenegro on the title anywhere. What leads the story behind GM foods in Europe or GM seeds are impacting the way people buy food. That's a simple one. Those are three very simple ways how that same title would have been more efficient. Now let's look at the no-nos. Okay, so this year GM crops show, shown to affect health indicators. Okay, well, it's good enough, but it's saying this year, so it, you know, next year it's really not going to be very, uh, very interesting. If you post it to your Facebook, and if at some point people go back to Facebook and kind of scroll down, it's either relevant or it's irrelevant. And in the five seconds or two seconds that I take to the site, whether I click on it or not, I already lost interest because it says this year and it says underneath posted in November 2013 and we are in 2016, so I'm not going to click. Where, uh, or the one below that refers to a month, uh, which would be even worse. The where lead, is there GM food in Montenegro? That's the same. That, that's the original. So that would be one of the leads that you wouldn't use. The who? Well, a quote from uh, there's there's an important person in that article. So why not mention the important person in the in the title? The Minister of Agriculture, Peter Ivanovic, says that GM foods affect health. That's fine, but you know, Peter Ivanovic, if I'm in England, doesn't really ring a bell, and I don't know who he is, and I don't really care. And so all I care is. GM foods affect health. That's, that's what the point is. So, this article was 963 words. So, the question is, was this an article that we designed or that we intended for the YRE website? Was this an article for online media? Was this an article for print media? Uh, if it's for an online version of print media, so most newspapers on paper now have online versions, if it's for an online version of a, of a print media, that might be okay. And that might even have, have a, a paper version. But if that's going to a news aggregator, if that's something that you want to see in a news aggregator, even though it's published originally in an online media, you need to make sure that that's news aggregator fitted. And if it's not, if it's more than 500 words, they're not going to catch it because it's too long. People, it doesn't bring clicks. What a news aggregator wants is things that make people click, because when you click, you look at my banners, there's publicity, you click on other articles, that's how they work. And that means that if you have your thousand words article, you, you want to make sure that somehow you collapse that into 500 words if you want to get caught by that machine. 
Then when we come to photos, photo reporting, and that's a whole different art, so I'm not even going to go into that. It's, it's a different type of journalism. Uh, but I do think, just picking up on the conversation from earlier today, I do think that you need to have a conversation about photojournalism. What is it that it means nowadays? Uh, and what is behind taking a picture that tells a story uh, and a picture that would be an award-winning picture? Right? The, I, I think I will agree with Stephanie on uh, what she was saying, that manipulation is a really terrible word because 20 years ago, that was what we saw it as. The picture has been manipulated. But nowadays, manipulation, to call it that, is what we do on a daily basis. There's people that work in newspapers doing that on a daily basis, editing the textures, editing the uh, color of the sky, making sure that something is popping out of the picture. That's a manipulation, but here's the important thing, it does not change the picture, it does not change the story. What you guys mean by manipulation on those criteria are pictures that are changed in a way that the story is perceived differently. And there needs to be a distinction there, I think. But that's all I'm going to say about uh, photos. And about videos, you know, new media is media. Video is changing every day. People are coming up with all sorts of different ways of doing videos. And so it's important to keep up with the times. You know, even serious news uh, networks are doing videos that are kind of out of the box and experimental. And so there's nothing wrong with trying those things uh, and maybe following those institutions that do those things that are kind of the most avant-garde and make sure that we are in line with those because this is actually changing on a daily basis. And another two examples, same article, let's imagine we're doing it for Facebook. So food safety inspection authorities look at GM foods due to possible health impacts, that's the title. And then you go with the hashtags. GM, food safety, GM foods, Monsanto, and we're putting Monsanto there because Monsanto is one of the biggest GM food producers in the world. And so when you hashtag it, all the people that care about Monsanto and what Monsanto is doing to GM foods or to food in wherever they are, if they follow that hashtag, they're going to get it on their, on their timeline at some point. Uh, you can hashtag Montenegro there because you're not putting it on the title, but anyone that follows things about Montenegro is still going to get it. Uh, uh, oh, it's not food cycles, it's uh, food cycles. And then you use the, uh, the et. So the, the et, as you might know, brings the, the institutions on Facebook, so fee or your own uh, institution. So you, you would do et Young Reporters for the Environment, and you'll have the drop-down menu that shows you the page, a preview of the page of Young Re Reporters, and you click on it, and they're tagged. And so what happens is that in Denmark, Gosha and Yukiku are going to get a notice that you posted something on, the wire, on your YRE page. And the beauty of that is that they are connected to all of you. And so they repost it and all of you get it immediately. It's, it's that simple. Oh. Twitter. Uh, food safety inspection authorities look at GM foods. Notice how I hashtag GM. Uh, due to possible health impacts. That's, uh, that's really short. And then you replace, you see the, the link at the bottom, that's the original link. You replace it with the bit.ly, which is the most common uh, link shortening mechanism. You put the original link, you get a 10 character link, and it works exactly the same. And you hashtag it after that. And it's exactly 140 characters. Now, if you want to use a picture, you, you might need to take maybe one of those hashtags because pictures actually take about 10 characters, sometimes 12, it depends on the picture. And so you could take Montenegro out and then you can attach a picture. The, the, the advantage of doing that is that we have evidence that shows that if you have pictures on your Twitter, you have that much more attention to your post. And if you have a video and you actually post it starting with the words video in capital letters, you have that much more attention. And so if you can use pictures, use a picture. If you can use a map, use a map. If you can use a video, use a video. This is the picture that was, uh, the top picture that was used to illustrate the article originally. It's kind of disturbing, actually. Uh, and that below is what I, what I would use as a possible caption. You know, how safety, a major concern as GM foods enter the European market, and then it should say photo source. And I put that in that way because it says in the article that the pictures were sourced from the internet. So that's not enough, actually. That's not how you do it. 
you need to say where you got the picture. So source is this. That's appropriate journalism. But there's also another problem, and I think this has been a problem with YRE for 20 years now, that the captions very often describe what's on the picture. And that's kind of the no-no of photojournalism. You are supposed to be able to look at the picture and know what it is. So what you use the caption for is to give me, the reader, extra information that I can't take out of the picture. Right? You take an important sentence out of the article and you put it there as a caption. You don't need to tell me that it's a fetal inside a tomato because I can't see that. <laughs> So this is the one that they use, and this could be the one that you would use for Facebook and Twitter. Right? It's, it's kind of catchy, so you could use this. But if, you, if your entry, so this is the, the, last, uh, the last thing, if your entry as that article was not an article, but a photo for the photo contest, then your photo could not have been that other photo, because that's, well, it's manipulated in a bad way. This would be more of it, and this is kind of boring, I just quickly searched online something about genetically modified foods and so this would be a picture that you could enter and then I mean the picture in itself is not powerful enough but then you could do something with a caption that brings the power to the picture so health safety concern as GM foods enter the European market GM food safety Montenegro and that's it right and then you could uh, you know, you have FAO and IFA there, there's two examples. You're talking about food, talk with the organizations that have food concerns at the fore. And make sure you hashtag them, make sure you, you connect them to your article. So, final thing, uh, is it time to rethink the uh, YRE outputs? What is an article nowadays? What is, do you really need a thousand words? If you're talking about complex scientific work and you have things to explain by all means use a thousand but if all you're you're saying is that garbage is damaging the community and this is where well you could link it to a wider article but maybe you should think about a shorter version that is what you put out there and brings people in uh, remember the media has changed remember however that some of the things from 20 years ago remain the same and so the way you engage the students while it doesn't use the same tools, has to be the same. People write about things that they care or should write about things that they care because the only way you, you sustain a passion is if you write about something that you care. And so if you uh, are making a student write about garbage because you, you know, we've decided that garbage is the theme of the year, that's, that's a, a possible model, but is that the most efficient model? Uh, is it not maybe that 20 years ago when we had five or six different themes and the schools chose and the students participated in that choice, is that not potentially a better way to do it? I don't know. So I think there's things from now that are relevant, there's things from 20 years ago that are relevant, and that's it. Now you applause. <laughs>